All right, welcome back to this week's episode of the Movie Babble Podcast. This week, you got myself, Colin, and I'm joined by Nick, and uh, in spirit, Martin Scorsese. Um, so we'll just go ahead and jump right in. <laughs> it's uh, It's been a couple weeks uh, since we had our normal format between the Super Bowl and then with uh, Sundance and quite a few other things, but we're getting back into it. And uh, we're, we're going to just start with uh, <laughs> film Twitter. Uh, so Martin Scorsese had a an essay come out um, I guess it was about a week and a half ago now, um, which I'm not going to read all of because it's pretty long, uh, but I will paraphrase. And basically, um, some of the big takeaways were talking about how um, streaming content has become content. So uh, at least the part that stuck out to me the most and the part that I would see get kind of quoted and uh, hacked up a bit on Twitter is just talking about how um, even, even, you know, five years ago, there was a strong difference between seeing a movie as a movie, you know, going to the theater, or seeing it on the big screen um, versus watching something on YouTube versus, you know, tuning on to Comedy Night Done Right at seven o'clock on, on Thursday. Um, we're just talking about how streaming has really kind of merged merged mer- meshed and merged i try to say those together um, merged <laughs> all those things um into one title into content so now um there's no real difference because whether i'm watching killers of the flower moon or watching uh house hunters i can just sit there with it on my tv while i sit on my phone and i just pulled my phone up even though nobody's going to be able to see that part um <laughs> but that you know and, and he gives credit to the fact that, yes, um, he has been equipped by streaming providers like Netflix um, a lot. And they are giving people opportunities to make things that probably wouldn't be made, at least not to the same degree um, without them. But at the same time, they're also taking away from a lot of the experience. And especially within um, the past year, as we've gone through uh, coronavirus and, and most theaters nationwide and worldwide have been shut down um, if they're not still shut down. And that seems to be driving forward. And then um, I think that kind of ties into the whole issue we saw with uh, Christopher Nolan and Warner Brothers last month, too, with, you know, now these streaming services are just trying to get stuff out, um, even if it's not necessarily what's intended or what's best for that um, work itself. Uh, But that is Marty's essay in a nutshell, though not said nearly as eloquently or as uh, masterfully. (laughs) <laughs> it's funny because most of the essay is on how much he loves Fellini and all of his work, and uh, which is really interesting. I read the whole thing. I encourage everyone to actually read it because he has a lot of interesting points about Fellini and makes me want to go back and rewatch Eight and a Half again sometime soon. But um, yeah, like the first like five paragraphs are about kind of everything you mentioned. Um, and I stay in Marty on this one. I feel like every time he's come out and said things, I've just been like, yeah, he's, he's right. He, he makes a lot of really good points. And, um, I feel there is a certain group of people out there who kind or kind of want to just toss Marty to the side and kind of say, Oh, he's one of these guys who's turning into back in my day or get off my lawn kind of thing. But, um, he is really true. Cause I feel like I've been in this battle for a couple of years now where I hate using the word content. I despise it. And we, and there is nothing, there is no better word to like take its place. I thought about this and I've even like put it in like the, the movie battle group chats at some point. It's like, what's a better word to use than content? Cause I don't want to use it anymore. A <laughs> and quick we could... bite. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Bring back Quibi. I can't wait to see all their stuff on Roku whenever that happens. <laughs> but it's so true because it's we don't have another word for it. And so like this slow creep of what the word means is just kind of taken over everything. Um, and it's funny because I don't know if you had the chance to listen to it, but there was an Empire podcast with um, Edgar Wright and Quentin Tarantino that released like a week and a half ago or something like that. And it was three hours long. It was this crazy behemoth of a thing. Um, I encourage everyone to listen to it after um, they listen to all of our podcasts and read all, all of our articles on Movie Babble twice. Then you can go over and listen to it. But um, 
they had they, Edgar Wright shared this really interesting frustration where he was watching Mank for like award stuff and whatever guild he belongs to. I guess it's the director's guild. He's a director who directs things, but um, he just wanted to know who this one actor was at the end of the movie. But Netflix was already they already brought up the suggestions of like, oh, you might like you might like like this movie if you've watched Mank. And he was just like, no, I just want to watch the credits and see who this person was. And since there's obviously no other way to watch that movie, he just never could figure that out through Netflix because uh, they were just pushing him on to watch something else. Mm. So it is interesting because you think of all these little things that have happened where, yeah, we, we you don't go to a movie theater now uh, and watch eight and a half or some other Italian movie or something else that's brought over from France or all these other great places where movies, um, frankly, the best movies that are coming from South Korea, things like uh, places like that. Um, it's a different time, um, now, which is a little bit of a bummer. So I can, I hear his pain and I, I agree. I love Marty. He's the best. <laughs> He's one of the best people ever to, uh, kind of, infuse these really interesting but great movies that are beloved by everybody and infuse them with really interesting ideas um so i feel like he's gained the system so well in that place but in that sense but um yeah i i do agree with him quite a bit here yeah and i think the other really interesting point that he brings up is about kind of the homogenization of just how people or what people are watching um is probably more apt but and we, we see this a lot with Facebook and just like how people get really entrenched in what they already gravitate towards. Um, we saw this a lot in the, the last two elections, but um, because the algorithms, the way they work is they just give you more of what you're already enjoying because Netflix's goal is not to enlighten you with, you know, whatever point the artist is making. Netflix's goal is to keep you on Netflix and keep you away from the evils of Disney Plus and HBO and all those competing or com <laughs> competing competing streaming services. Um, and so the issue with that is so, you know, if I if I get on there and I watch We Can Be Heroes, um, the next it's going to get me into Spy Kids. And so the next thing I know all week, I've only watched basically the same genre, the same crew, same, same actor and director, which I don't think is always a bad thing. But over time, I'm just over and over watching more of the same type of content. So I'm, I'm only watching action blockbusters, then I'm only going to be watching action blockbusters because that's all Netflix is going to throw my way. Um, and so if, if I want to go and try and watch something like Eight and a Half, um, or even watch something um, that's, you know, just, just a slightly different vein um, that's American cinema. Um, I'm going to have to go out of my way because Netflix is not going to be presenting that to me. So then it becomes a conscious choice that the user has to make when they might not even know that certain options are out there because all they're seeing is this type of content or that type of content. Yeah, and it's so true. I just want to read two sentences that marty actually wrote where it's he says curating isn't undemocratic or elitist a term that is now used so often that it's become meaningless it's an act of generosity you're sharing what you love and what has inspired you and that's so true and he mentions he specifically mentions criterion channel and movie as two streaming services that are really he really likes because they don't obviously they don't have these crazy algorithm things they just present to you these really interesting and curated lists of films that you can go explore at your leisure so you're the conscious the choice is back in your hands and it's not as um there's not like a little twist in there from netflix giving you three options that you might like so you can skip from a david lean to martin Scorsese to agnes varda instead of just going down a hole of true crime like so many people on <laughs> netflix do you know but i always this, there's this thing that I always struggle with where when we talk film, I think we are always in our own little bubble. We can talk about how great Fellini is or even just how great David Fincher is. But if you go to someone who is just casually watching something on Netflix and you mention, hey, I watched this really good uh, Roberto Rossellini film or I watched this even this really good David Fincher film, they're just going to look at you like you have like – three eyes or something like they're like they have no idea who these people are which is so crazy to think about because i think well i don't know i maybe i can speak for you but i feel like 
these filmmakers and others like just are really impactful just in film itself and why we love movies but there is just this disconnect there between what we like and just what the casual person on Netflix really enjoys. Um, and I think that kind of what we were saying before, the way Netflix does um, create these algorithms and the way they are teaching you to watch things, you're literally growing up. You're with people who, who, who grow up, who are growing up with streaming. You're literally teaching them how to watch things without, having all of their having their eyes open to new and interesting things that might challenge them right because you're not you're not putting on eight and a half in the back when you're in the back room <laughs> when you when you put when you're doing your laundry you know <laughs> like that's just that you sit there and you study that movie and all the interesting choices it makes um i feel like i could go on and on about that kind of idea about the passive watching of films but um I, I do I see his frustration because he clearly loves all of these films and I I doubt he's at home watching We Can Be Heroes on a Saturday <laughs> night, you know, uh, and not that We Can Be Heroes this is some awful thing, but it's just when you see this imbalance of casual entertainment and the way that um, Netflix and Disney and these other streamers are teaching you to watch things and the the balance is way out of whack between something that's just like, Hey, here's all this great stuff that you can watch. And here's all these essays that go with it and help you understand it and all these different things. Like, uh, it's tough and people are just going to keep choosing the, choosing the easy option. Right. So, um, yeah, I, he seems to write a lot of this with a lot of pain in his heart for capital C cinema, but, um, I certainly do agree with a lot of it. I think it's a, it's a struggle that I have a lot too. when I try to talk about why I love movies to someone who is like, like my aunt or something who watches like a movie, like a year or something like that. You know, it's just, it's a weird disconnect. That's, it's really hard to describe sometimes. Yeah, it is. It is difficult when you're like trying to get into to film. That's a little deeper. Um, so like for, for me, for example, like the only movies that my family really watches are Adam Sandler or like eighties action movies. So when I started like branching out into capital C cinema, uh, I was like, I don't, who who do I talk to about uh, Seven Samurai? Because nobody I know is, you know, <laughs> um, or things like that. Um, but yeah, I th I think streaming and and, and don't get me wrong, because I think Netflix has been phenomenal. Like I, I think all these services are really great ways to like watch new things. Um, but you have to be intentional about it, and you know I I think streaming loses some of the flavor um it's, it's almost like you know uh think way back to the age of blockbuster um <laughs> when you, you go into the store and you you don't really have any guidelines except it's all alphabetized and maybe there's going to be like a you know a, a little recently released um little little section but a lot of it is going out and saying, you know what, this looks kind of interesting. I want to check this out. And it might be some horrible fourth sequel to some obscure movie from the 90s that they had an outside animation studio do for like $20. Uh, but there's still a lot of fun in the exploration, even when you watch something that's really bad or that you really don't care for. Um, and, and you don't get that if you're just constantly being given a feed of, well, you liked this, so obviously you're going to like this. Yeah, and I do think it's, it's. I feel like it's. It's also this thing of instant gratification that we. I feel like has seeped into a lot of what we do, where it's just like there's constant things for getting fired at you. You watch this clip on YouTube, you go over TikTok, watch something, and things are flying by you. Um, but I, I love being able to sit with something and the struggle with it. Like I think one of the coolest things about Criterion Channel and all these other things, which I, which is what I think uh scorsese is talking about when he talks about like the elite the elitist uh, view of something being carried and all that where i think it's great I, I know i'm in the hands of people who really love film and in a lot of ways know a lot more than i do where i can just sit down and say oh there's this new uh string of films that criterion released on the surface that i can watch and maybe i have no uh basis for what these movies are who these people are who made these movies but i can watch it and then struggle with it, understand it, and then re read all of this scholarship and I learn so many things about why this movie is important in its own way. And even if I don't like it, I can create, I can create this sense of appreciation for it. Um, obviously, 
it's a tough thing too because it's like how do I, it's like goes to this crazy philosophical thing of like what do you value right and so people a lot of people like i said they just kind of want to have things on and that comfort is a thing that i i definitely do as well um we'll talk about wandavision in a second i put that on when i was making like food for myself the other day and it was great and had a great time you know <laughs> so i do understand that feeling a lot but it's just i go back to the it's the imbalance of it all where um a lot of this stuff um does, should have its place and uh, i think it's true scorsese you mentions that it really doesn't um i think he, he ends he basically ends this um essay after talking about Fellini's films for a while where it's just like um he doesn't really like his films they really don't have a place in the marketplace today and that's so true um like I said it's tough to get in it's tough to get into these things sometimes but I think there's so much to there's so much uh rewarding stuff there for people who are willing to take the dive in I don't know. To me, it just sounds like he's jealous he's never directed a Marvel movie. <laughs> oh, man. All the Marvel uh, profile picture guys <laughs> just coming for Marty again. It's just, I just didn't want to have to deal with the whole Marvel thing and the whole, what did he call it? The roller coaster ride? <laughs> the Marvel yeah. movies. It's just, I just couldn't, I couldn't even deal with that angle of all of this. <laughs> Yeah, the uh, <laughs> some of the memes coming out of that, and just like like uh, Martin Scorsese mob flick, mob flick, mob flick, and then like some of the <laughs> descriptions for the Marvel movies were like psychological groundbreaking, uh, like uh, sci-fi thriller or something, and it's just like Iron Man two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what did the I saw that thing too? What do they call? Winter Soldier. It was like surreal avant-garde mystery or something like that. Like mystery thriller. <laughs> it's the most <laughs> insane thing I've ever heard in my life. Um, and that's also an unbelievable self-own, right? Because they only... It's, how many movies has Martin Scorsese made at this point? Like 60? I don't even know. Yeah. <laughs> it's like uh, that great mob flick, Silence. Just <laughs> really good. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's it's tough. I feel like he is... In a sense, he's like shouting into the void a little bit because I feel like people who are only go or only watching Marvel movies every year, like, are they going to go out and watch the French New Wave next week? No, right? They're going to keep doing what they're doing, and their version of an indie movie will be like, "Hey, I watched this. Uh, I watched this movie called uh, Inception the other day, and it was really, it was really interesting, right?" So. Um, like he's not going to change those behaviors, but um, I do appreciate him kind of standing for this because it, it really does matter. And to people, people like us who do really appreciate these films and want them to have a to have a voice in all of this, I I think stuff like this is important. Yeah, it's just always fun to watch like the chaos unfold whenever another one of these like Marty quotes starts going viral again. Because <laughs> um, there was like the whole thing, and I'm sure we'll probably see it again here in about three weeks. Uh, but like the first time he talked about when he was specifically talking about Marvel movies, um, all the DC people were like, "Yeah, this doesn't apply to us. Suck at Marvel." Like, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, man. I just it is. I just love Marty. I just want the best for him. <laughs> I, I hope he continues to just take all the money from all these streamers to make th interesting things. So <laughs> it's, yeah. I hope he keeps wielding his power in the best ways possible. Well, that's my thing is I, I think there's very firm ground for either like capital C cinema or capital C content. Um, like I, you know, I love watching Captain America pick up a magic hammer and beat a purple guy with it. Um, but at the same time, like, I also try to go out of my way and to, to find movies that I haven't seen before, even some that I haven't heard before um, that just are outside of my comfort zone in, in the sense of like outside of the movies that, you know, end of a long day or like while I'm doing something in the background I'd put on. Um, Cause I think there's a, there's a place for the, the theme park ride kind of movies um, as George Lucas would put it. Um, but yeah, I also think it's very important, especially for anybody that, that really wants to be like deeper involved in film and whether that's just watching movies or making movies or talking about movies or, you know, whatever you want to do. Um, I think it is important to go out and find just 
stuff that's even if it's not something that's crazy obscure or indie um, even if it's just outside of your own wheelhouse um, I think it's important to kind of challenge your your uh, critique and your your uh, understanding of film in that regard yeah it's like obviously like what you like I don't care if you want to spend your days watching Winter Soldier 50 different times like cool great I hope that brings you joy but um, I just like it's just what we're getting well, I think what Marty's driving at here is like that doesn't mean that all this other stuff should like deserves to be wiped away because it's some of the most important filmmakers ever like I remember when Winter Soldier came out, they were talking about um, the Russo brothers were like, oh, yeah, this is very much like the parallax view. And like, they were mentioning all of these 70s political thrillers and all that does kind of sound like director bullshit in a way. Because like, all right, you're making a like Captain America movie, like relax, dude. But um, a lot of these filmmakers are inspired by all like these John Cassavetes and all these early other important 70s filmmakers and before then, too. So. Um, all their stuff was great. It's just a different wavelength. Um, so I don't know, like what you like, but um, just, I guess, just let all people have their things, I guess. <laughs> it's the struggle we have with all this stuff. Just let everyone enjoy what they like and also be open to new things. I feel like that's one of those things they teach you in kindergarten, but never kind of sinks in. Who knows? But <laughs> I think it's something we all kind of struggle with a little bit. Yeah, and I mean, I'm sure it's only going to get worse, <laughs> uh, but we we can hope. Uh, One can hope. We have saints like Marty out here looking looking out for all of us. <laughs> Marty is like the Avatar from the hit TV show Avatar. He's <laughs> master of all the elements, <laughs> just holding the line. Uh, my hat's off to you, Martin. Just keep just keep being great. Uh, I loved pretend pretend it's a city with um, Fran Lebowitz on Netflix. Just two crotchety uh, New York people talking about how awful and great New York is at the same time. That was another great thing that he used Netflix's money for. So <laughs> just keep doing your thing, Marty. Just keep fighting the good fight. I'm a big fan of Mob Flick Three. <laughs> my favorite is Mob Flick Four. That's my favorite. <laughs> Would that be the Irishman? No, that would be Shark Tale. Is, wait, is Shark Tale a mob movie? What is happening? <laughs> yeah, Shark Tale's... <laughs> Shark Tale, it has De Niro and Scorsese. It can't not be a mob movie. <laughs> but it's like... <laughs> they like own a car wash or something. Or no, Will Smith is like... He hires a shark to uh, like be his bodyguard or something like that. But then all the all the other fish are like, oh... Will Smith is his fish is the tough one, and uh, <laughs> they sing at the car wash at some point. Uh, that's about as much as I remember from Shark Tale. <laughs> I don't know. I think maybe my favorite Scorsese mob flick is probably Kundun. There's just so much great <laughs> mob stuff in that one. <laughs> uh, good old Marty. Um, and he actually has like a pretty diverse acting career like you don't really think of martin scorsese as an actor but he's actually done like quite a bit of acting uh, i mean a lot of it's like in his own films or projects he's producing but still he's a he's a renaissance man if um if i can plug pretend pretend it's a city one more time um the, people might hate this immediately because friend Leibowitz is very much an acquired taste but scorsese is often on screen with her and he is like the most amazing screen partner just for having a conversation because he his laugh is so great and he laughs so hard at everything Fran Leibowitz is saying. It just it's so infectious. I love it. He's just what a guy. What an amazing man. <laughs> Thank you, Martin. Thank you for your service. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so uh, and we're going to divert just straight into uh, capital C content. Um, with Wonder Vision. Yeah, what a segue, really. Go from that from Marty to Marvel. <laughs> Which I do think WandaVision would be really interesting for anybody that wants to learn about like just the structure of TV shows because you can watch that single episode, but you can learn a lot about basically like the history of sitcoms. Um, so, so even though at the end of the day it's going to be two people waving their hands in front of a green screen, 
Um, I think you can learn a lot about just like the the craft put into recreating all of these um, different styles and whatnot. But uh, that's that's my Marvel plug um, before we get in. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's really heating up. Um, you know, we're on episode seven out of nine as of this last week. Um, we still don't really have any concrete answers. Uh, which the content-driven internet really hasn't uh, comprehended at this point. Um, and I say that as someone who watched all of Stranger Things Season 3 in one day. Um, but it's it's honestly kind of nice, like, having that week of anticipation and just, like, texting uh, with all my friends to be like, oh, what do you think of this? Like, what, what kind of nonsense do you think we're getting into next week? Like, what does this two-second reveal at the end of the episode mean? Um, so it's, it's nice having that gap, um, and especially after we've had some pretty big bombs in the past three episodes. Um, so it's nice to be in that, that, you know, old age of waiting a week for TV. Yeah. I feel like it's been a minute since I've been on here talking about the show, but I, I agree. I love waiting a week. It's, it's the best because every time I sit down, like we've gotten to the point where I don't really watch a, like a ton of TV. For most of all, because if I have a, an extra hour or two, I'm going to watch a, a new movie that I have to talk about on here or on the site or whatever. But um, besides that, it, sometimes it's just such a commitment because everyone's like, oh, like Breaking Bad is the best thing ever. It's like, all right, I'll get to it at some point. I'll watch it. I promise. But you look at the mountain of shows that are ahead of you. and It's, it's just, man, that's just a lot to get through. I don't know if I can do it. So then you just don't. But sitting down for 35 minutes every week with eight minutes of credits is it's just the best. <laughs> like I will never be on this podcast saying WandaVision is the best thing ever. Cause it's, I think it's pretty par for the course as far as Marvel goes, it's very slick and fun and it's a lot of plot and really not much else, but you know what? That's fine. Sometimes I think it's really fun. Uh, but putting that on for 27 minutes of content is, uh, is great. It's really good. It's capital C content, that's for sure. I don't know. There were some pretty nice aspect ratio changes in this last episode. <laughs> there was. I noticed that this time. I was like, ah, oh, look at all this cinema happening in front of my face. <laughs> um, but what I really liked about this episode in particular was how they, they – obviously it was like a modern family, the office kind of style of mockumentary. Um, but I liked how they committed to that even when they were breaking and doing – more like MCU-ish stuff rather than sitcom-y stuff. Um, and then, yeah, there were some smooth aspect ratio changes. We, I don't know. I don't think we got the big bad reveal. I think it's a misdirect, uh, but that's my that's my opinion. But I thought it was a pretty solid episode. Oh, interesting. Because I always, my rule, I feel feel like for, for Marvel Forever is when there's a, a name actor who's inexplicably a supporting character, they're always the villain. So I just assumed when Catherine Hahn, I guess spoilers, but when Catherine Hahn was revealed to be this evil witch thing, um, I don't really know, Agnes the Witch, I don't even know. As some, I'm, some comic book person is probably really yelling at me right now, but uh, <laughs> I just assumed, oh yeah, there's, there's our villain. So we're going to have two episodes of her just hamming it up and going crazy as Catherine Hahn does, which is always wonderful, but interesting. So what, what, so what are your theories? My thing is, so I googled her character um, in the all-knowing Wikipedia page. Uh, <laughs> made no mention of Agatha having ever been a villain in the comics. So I was like, "Well, Wikipedia can't lie." Um, but the more <laughs> the more I got to thinking about it, like, so the the big reveal is her little theme, which has just been absolutely everywhere on my TikTok feed. Um, I can't tell you how many TikToks I've seen, sent, or been sent that are just that theme and like somebody dancing <laughs> in the background. <laughs> um, but it like it goes through just like a little brief sequence of her just like disrupting everything in the neighborhood. I got to think about it and like she's not really doing anything bad. I mean, she yeah, she killed a dog maybe, um, but <laughs> was if was it a real dog in the first place? Um, but we also have to remember like Wanda's enslaved and kidnapped like three thousand people. And this other witch just happens to kind of be there. And all the things that she's doing to disrupt it have helped push Vision out of, like, his little trance state and try and escape or at least figure out what's going on and who he is. Uh, so I don't – I don't know. I'm not firmly into the she's the bad guy thing. And then all the 
supposedly there's still like one big character we haven't met yet who's an actor Paul Bettany's always wanted to work with. So I and and this is just spitballing here, but I think it's going to be uh Chewetel Ijefor because he's like the chief bad magi- magician in the MCU after Doctor mm-hmm. Strange. So that is my uh my crazy WandaVision theory is that he's actually behind it and we're just being given false information. That's interesting. I feel like wouldn't I feel that would be kind of frustrating if he just pops in halfway through the next episode. It's like just kidding, guys. It's been me. I don't know. That's just me. But um, that is interesting. Where because it is true. Like I feel like I haven't thought similar to you because I feel like this is something that Marvel will never want to interrogate fully because yeah like wanda has enslaved all of these people and it's kind of <laughs> kind of monstrous of her and i just assume that the they'll stop the witch and save the day and that'll be over i just <laughs> maybe that's me being a little bit of a pessimist but i just never assumed that they would try to interrogate how, how, how awful she's been <laughs> this entire series well and like the other thing is this is basically the first step into the next phase um <laughs> And and so this and Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness, uh, which just picked up Danny Elfman this past week, by the way, and uh, Spider-Man 3 um, were all supposed to be kind of the big framework for where the MCU is going. So I'm assuming it's going to be really fixated on like whatever the magical fallout um, is from here. I know that the comic book they based a lot of this TV show off of ends with Scarlet Witch just like eliminating all of the mutants from reality. So we could see some like crazy, crazy like mutant inclusion or like Avengers exclusion kind of thing going on. Um, But I think they're really like jumping fully into the magic side because it's always been, you know, it's it's been a part of the MCU with like Thor and Doctor Strange for a while, but they always just kind of like science it out (laughs) um and so i think now we're actually getting into just like a straight weird witches and spells kind of magic which is kind of cool yeah everything you hear about spider-man 3 it's tom holland saying this is going to be the most insane thing you've ever (laughs) seen in your lives and i'm just like whoa chill down (laughs) chill out there a little tom you know like (laughs) let's relax a little bit but it does seem that they are going this way where it's more crazy wild shit and that's just the nature of the mcu where we've had i guess this is the 24th property because we've had 23 movies right is that the amount it's 23 or 24 something like that so if this this is the 24th thing that we've had so that's one of the great things about building this universe and where you can you can make all of these uh, like critiques about oh these movies are just about themselves they aren't really about anything except their own plot but after when you when you're around for this long you, your audience just accepts where you're going with things you can get more crazy and crazy with stuff and they'll be like yeah i buy it this is cool i like it um so it's a testament to just the amazing just work that's been, happened over i don't know how many years is it 2008 to now so 13 years uh, but yeah it's impressive and I've I've never been the biggest MCU fan. Well, I guess I was when we first started because I was 13. But um, <laughs> it's uh, it's cool. I like watching it. It's fine. It's really fun. Yeah, it's uh, it's nice because it just it feels really different from a lot of things um, that are on streaming TV right now. Um, in the sense that it's like it's definitely a bolder like experiment and trying to jump into all these sitcoms, especially with the first two episodes that were literally just 30 minutes of like classic sitcoms. Um, but it's still like that lighthearted MCU kind of fun. Um, so you get a little bit of both each week. And uh, I mean, Disney plus is pretty much going to own all of our collective Fridays at, for forever. Like they're even just their Marvel slate is like lined up for the end of the year, there's just like a new episode of some Marvel TV show every Friday. And then like when you throw all the extra Disney stuff on it, like by, by the end of 2022, there will be no other TV. It'll just be Disney plus originals. Yeah. And then Marty will just be over 
to the side, just screaming and writing 5,000 word essays. <laughs> Maybe we can get him to write one for ba- for a movie battle. That'd be great. <laughs> Marty, okay. just talk to my agent. That'd be great. <laughs> okay, but uh, Capital C Cinema, The Muppet Show is also on Disney Plus, so it's not all content. <laughs> <laughs> I do appreciate the one thing I do really appreciate is the, the commitment to every single week we're spoofing a different kind of TV show, which I really appreciate. <laughs> Uh, but it makes it makes me curious what they're gonna do for next week. You think this because I can't really think of like because you think of the '90s and they, they spoof that really well, and you go all the way back to the first couple of episodes and you do I Love Lucy and all that stuff. But I can't really think of a defining TV style from the 2010s, which is like which is if they're decade hopping, which would be the next one, right? So I can't really think of what they would do in that sense. So. Maybe this is yeah. when the time they actually break away from that. Yeah, and it's interesting because when you get to the 2010s, TV kind of died. Like, because um, <laughs> all, all the shows really from like 2005 onward was where people realized they could just watch things online the next day, and so all the good shows got canceled and then like picked up by streamers later on. Um, so like, yeah, we're in a decade where nobody really watched TV except for like these mini seasons, kind of like Breaking Bad or Game of Thrones, where there's only like. 10 episodes but yeah i can't think of like a a sitcom where everybody was like yeah you know thursday night seven o'clock my whole neighborhood came over and we watched uh you know the big bang theory together or i don't know (laughs) i guess it would be the big bang theory right i don't know what else it would be because they've done the they've done the direct to camera and they still haven't done i guess i mean they have done the sitcom but i guess it would be like a big bang style thing I well, can't they think of anything a, else. They haven't done a reality show yet. Oh, that'd be a good idea. Do we do? Do we do Wandavision, Jersey Shore? Is that what we're? <laughs> in, is that what we're heading towards? <laughs> I mean, they are in Jersey, so that's true. Oh, it's all lining up perfectly. We've we've got it. <laughs> yeah, and then I feel like the last week they'll probably throw that out the window. Um, for the most part, because even like you had, you know, that one episode, like episode four, where it was all like that MCU style, um, just like mini movie that was all about Monica. So I feel like they'll probably throw it out the window at some point, um, especially as like Wanda continues to break down a little bit more. But I could be wrong. There could be, I don't know, like a Game of Thrones episode or what do people watch <laughs> besides this? <laughs> They, they're watching Fellini on the Criterion channel. <laughs> oh, maybe they'll do an animated one. That'd be good. I feel like, I feel like it makes sense because we just because they're, they're playing the seeds of uh, Wanda just losing her shit and not being able to control anything. So maybe that's when we go into the pure insane and things start becoming animated. I'd be, for, I'd be here for it. A claymation. <laughs> I'm sold. I want that. I want an entire episode of Marvel claymation. Uh, but yeah, that is that is WandaVision um, and then Netflix, uh, capital C content Netflix, except for when they drop. Um, they actually drop a fair amount of cinema. But um, let's go run through their top 10 for the past week. Uh, so we already talked about We Can Be Heroes, but unfortunately it was not the number one movie. Um, so let's just go ahead and start with number one was I care a lot, um, which released on the streaming service. Um, and then number two is to all the boys always and forever followed by no escape room. Number four animals on the loose, a you wild movie. Number five, war dogs. Number six, we can be heroes. Number seven, secret life of pets Two. number eight, finding Ohana. Number nine, the crudes and number 10 fate, the winks saga, the after party. A movie with three titles. <laughs> um, I have no idea what that is. I I don't think I want to know what that is. To, to be <laughs> honest. <laughs> um. So I care a lot. Um. Reminds me of a hit movie from a few years ago called The Good Liar. Uh, so I did not feel. <laughs> <laughs> you stuck it in. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> feel the need uh, to see this movie yet. Um. But I've seen. Like, it's been fairly buzzy. Um, I know a lot of the critics were like, the disconnect between audience and critics has been uh, pretty wide. Like, it's a big gap. It's like 80% on around, it's it's in the 80s. It's not 80 exactly. Percent around tomatoes and the audience score is in the 30s. 
Um, so people seem to be having very mixed reactions to it. Um, but I know you are one of those people with a reaction to it. So take it away. Yeah, I don't know what the reason is for that crazy um, difference. I feel like that might be the latest Rotten Tomatoes review bombing that happens every so often. Where it's like every so often there's a movie that has women in it or it's a Star Wars movie. <laughs> and it's it's like the critics like it decently enough and then it's just oh all the other people hated it so i don't know if that's there's a lot of truth there but um it's funny because i feel like i'm right in the middle of this where i think this movie's okay uh this is it's the, the latest in the long line of movies about how awful you have to be to work to make it in capitalism uh so it's rosamund pike is the lead in this and she's amazing in this movie she's the best part but she runs a company which basically um she's the legal guardian for uh, who knows a ton of different elderly people but basically she has it in with this doctor and all these other people around town where she can basically convene these emergency trials to say hey this person can no longer take care of themselves so they need a legal guardian because they have nobody else or no one else is really in the picture so she can swoop in and now she's in control of all their assets and then she basically puts them in a home and sells off all their stuff and makes a fortune on it. And it's really, really like she's just an awful person. And I think that's maybe why some people dislike this movie because there's really no good people in it. But um, she kind of gets um, more than she bargained for when she does this to Diane Weist, who is lovely. I always love seeing her. Um, and she has connections to the underworld, uh, specifically Peter Dinklage, who is this big bad in this movie, who is uh, really fun and hamming it up. And he wears he has this really big beard and he has uh, just a man bun and he's going nuts. Um, so, yeah, it descends into violence and awfulness. And it's a whole movie about how you need to be a sociopath to make it in capitalism. And that's kind of that's kind of it. Um you wish that the movie had more on its mind other than, hey, man, capitalism, capitalism isn't good, you know? <laughs> so um, on the thematic level, there's really not much going on in this movie, but it's really stylish. Um, there's really just really fun pulsating uh, sequences in it, and Rosamund Pike is phenomenal in it. She's so good. And there's a lot of people saying that, oh, she's back. This is her return from like back to gone girl or whatever, but I mean, she's been around and she's been a good performer in a few other movies. So I don't know if that's true, but she is unbelievable in this movie and she's the reason to watch it. But, um, yeah, I don't know. So there's a lot of great costumes and fun, like fun banter back and forth between people just being terrible. But, um, I wish it was about something more than saying, Hey, capitalism you i don't like you <laughs> you know <laughs> uh so it's it's two hours of that so i guess your mileage may vary but i don't know yeah um it i mean it kind of just fits the netflix model in the sense that even if it's not getting just absolutely loved it's being very much talked about um which you can't say for all netflix movies but when it works it works like they get buzz more people watch more netflix movies and rinse and repeat yeah, it's super watchable, which I think it's a it's one of those where something crazy is happening every 10 minutes. Like there's a shootout in a nursing home at one point and you're like, what the hell is happening? And then there's all it just descends crazier and crazier. There's a lot of crazy stuff and there's fun people who show up. Chris Messina has a really good cameo in this movie as a sleazy lawyer. He shows up for a bit for a minute. Um, it is a good streaming movie. I was smart of Netflix to pick this one up because it's there's just always stuff happening. And there's people being devilish, devilishly charming at all times. So um, from that perspective, I can see why. And it's definitely a conversation starter in that sense. But um, I'm kind of hoping this movie isn't great. So I don't think it'll be a super awards contender. But I'm hoping that Rosamund Pike gets some late traction for, for Best Actress. Because I think she's really good in this movie. Even though I don't really like this movie, I think she has some things in, or that are amazing. This in this, she's just an unbelievable boss bitch kind of character where she is just ruling over everybody, and she keeps calling herself a lioness in this movie. It's fun, um, and the costume design is really good. She's wearing a lot of different like pantsuits and dresses and things like that, and she looks great. 
Um, and it just looks really, really fun. All the other actors have fun um, costumes as well. Um, so I hope it gets some traction there. But other than that, eh, it's fine. I guess capitalism is bad. I learned that. <laughs> I learned that from this movie. <laughs> um, and then, then the uh, the number two spot on Netflix. Now it's not a kissing booth movie. Um, but Sadly. it is pretty adjacent, so I figured you'd want to say a couple words. Uh, yeah, it's this is to all the boys three. It's the final one. Um, one of their, I guess we're getting the end to the Kissing Booth saga later this year, but it's one of their few franchises that's a film or film franchises, I guess, because they've had a ton of TV stuff come and go. But um, it's one of their big climaxes. Um, and frankly, I, I really like these movies a lot. I think the first Two All the Boys is a really good, almost classic level rom-com. Um, I think it's just really terrific and charming. The second one is, I can take it or leave it. And I like this one enough. But I just wanted to briefly mention it because I feel like this is one of the few rom-coms that's for teenagers that isn't the worst. <laughs> you know? Because... It's a good comparison to The Kissing Booth that that movie is just full of toxic relationships and people just being terrible to each other and but the movie treating it as if it's okay. And the one thing I think I've always really appreciated about the To All the Boys movies is that people act very realistically and there's a level of maturity to everything they do. So they have these crazy misunderstandings that that you see in a lot of different rom-coms, but they don't, the characters don't let that, those issues fester. They, maybe it goes on for a, a scene or two, but then people sit down and they have conversations. They talk about their feelings uh, and they clear everything up and then they move on. And I think there's something really mature about that that's in this movie. Because um, you have the same plot point that you've seen so many times in these movies where the two high school uh, lo- um, lovers want to go to the same college or whatever and one of them doesn't get in so it's this whole thing about oh no we can't continue our lives together and how terrible is this going to be so i'm just not going to tell the other person and it's going to be this crazy thing that doesn't get solved until the third act but uh until all the boys three they this they they have their just like they have their little wacky thing where a uh, large the main character can't say um tell uh peter played by noah centineo that um she got it. Uh, she didn't get in, but then a scene later, they sit down and have a conversation about it, and they figure out what's the best way for them to move forward. Um, I just kind of like that. The, this movie is not that like crazy or anything like special, but I think in a landscape where so many teen rom coms are just really, really bad and awful, I really appreciate a movie like this where it's just like, hey, let's all chat and like figure out our problems together and. Um, just improve each other. I, th- I think there's something really sweet about that. So I just wanted to mention this movie. It's it's delightful. Nice. Um, so then we'll kind of wrap up with what we've been watching in general. Um, so about two weeks ago, I had a thought. And that thought was, what if I watched a Sean Connery movie? <laughs> and then immediately after that, I had an even better thought. That was, what if I watched every Sean Connery movie? <laughs> um, so we were talking about it uh, before we started recording. Like, I've brought up Sean Connery quite a bit, uh, but I have officially committed to this deep dive of uh, the sexiest man of the century. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> um, first, I want to say a brief thing about this movie called Entrapment um, that I watched last night which is basically the plot of office space, except with jewel thieves instead of office drones. Um, So Sean Connery and Catherine Zeta Jones trying to rip off a bank by taking advantage of Y2K and stealing like pennies on every dollar. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But it's not very good. Watch office space instead. Um, But I did also watch one of his earlier films, which is a movie called time lock, uh, which came out in 1957 um, and is a British film about a boy who gets trapped in a bank vault. Um, so over the weekend, they go to um, set, set the bank, bank vault basically so that it can't be opened until Monday morning, um, even if you have the, the code and whatnot. And so 
this distraction happens, the one of the bank employees' sons gets locked in the vault. Um, and so basically, it's just, it's only like an hour and fifteen minutes, maybe. So it's a pretty breezy movie. Um, it's just all these people in this room trying to figure out how to get this kid out, and they're bringing experts in and like trying to hunt down a locksmith. Um, Sean Connery plays welder number two, uh, who, <laughs> as you would guess, is a welder, um, but actually uh, has quite a bit to do in this movie. Um, even if his character doesn't have a name, um, but it's really solid. Um, and then just watching a lot of uh, Sean Connery's pre-Bond work is just taking advantage of him being this, this really charming leading man. Either that or playing the heavy, because um, it's easy to forget just how big of a guy he was. Because um, when you see him all dappered up in the Bond suits or playing giddy old Henry Jones Sr., they don't really... Uh, fixate on just like how big of a man Sean Connery was and a lot of his movies are just like him being big and punching people uh, before he gets cast as James Bond <laughs> so it's it's fun to see him before he was famous uh, but that's that's all I'm going to say about Sean for this week I'm sure I'll, I'll have more thoughts as I <laughs> continue it's going to take spin- me at least like a year and a half but <laughs> just spin you off into your own Sean Connery pod where you're just talking to yourself in the void along with Martin Scorsese <laughs> I will be writing the Connery letter uh, in in reply to Scorsese's Fellini letter. <laughs> How many more movies of his do you have to watch? Um, so, and, and part of my letterbox stats are thrown off because they count a lot of things that aren't like actually movies that are just like, oh, well, this random repackaged interview from like 2019 counts as a Connery movie. Um, but supposedly... I'm at 60 titles out of 108, and that's because I knocked a lot of these interviews off already. So I probably have about, like, 30 more movies to do, and I'll have seen all of them. Um, But I've gotten through all of his really popular stuff, except for Robin Hood. Um, I watched Highlander 2 the other day. That was a mess. Um, But (laughs) I'm making my way through. It's nice because a lot of his early stuff is available for free or like streaming somewhere. Um, but yeah, it's, it's going to take a while. This is, uh, sounds, this is definitely uh, a year long commitment at least. That sounds really fun, but I think I'm just going to stick to my surreal avant-garde thrillers over here. And just, Are you telling me my... <laughs> you don't want to watch the 1983 Spanish documentary about the world cup that for some reason is narrated by Sean Connery and counts as part of this. <laughs> I kind of want to see that. Yeah, that sounds amazing. <laughs> that sounds great but uh oh my god um the one i wanted to talk about is um this movie called the empty man which came out last fall by uh disney got it in the fox merger and just threw it in theaters last year do you remember this movie did we talk about this movie at all when it was like on the release schedule I have vague memories of talking about it, but I kind of forgot that it existed. Uh, yeah, me which... too. <laughs> I don't think anyone knows this movie exists. But um, shout out to Spencer Henderson, one of our other lovely uh, movie Babel staff members. But um, he just texted me. He was like, hey, the Empty Man. It's really, really good. I was like, what? <laughs> it's not the Bye Bye Man. It's not one of these terrible horror movies and he was like no it's it's really really good so uh, I finally got to watching it this week and it's it's sitting at like a 42 percent on Rotten Tomatoes something like there it's just no it has like eight reviews no one barely saw it but uh I think I'm on the the empty man hype train this movie's great uh I rented it off of like Amazon or whatever but I don't think it's available anywhere else but um, I was amazed at how good this movie is. It's one of the most surprising, like genuine surprises I've had watching a movie in quite a long time. Cause I knew nothing about this movie, just that Spencer was like, Hey, you should watch it. Um, but it's great. And I, it's, it's amazing. And it, it does make a lot of sense why Disney would just dump this out in theaters. Cause it's an unbelievably grim, super weird, uh, two hour and 20 minute horror movie <laughs> it's like <laughs> disney is releasing marvel over here it's like what the like what the hell do we do with this thing so they just took advantage of the pandemic to be like all right we'll give it its release and then no one has to ever has to talk about it again uh but 
I'm here to say you should talk about it because it's a really good movie. I think it was filmed back in 2017. So even Fox had no idea what to do with this movie when it was first released. But it is so weird. Um, This director, David Pryor, had never really done anything before. He just did a lot of making of documentaries on David Fincher movies. So he directed (laughs) all of like the let me talk about Benjamin Button like like (laughs) DVD specials that you see. Um, But it's really funny because there's a lot of David Fincher in his uh, directing style. And this movie is so precise in a lot of ways. And every camera movement is very measured. Um, It's unbelievably strange. This movie, I, I can see this movie is not marketable at all. It's very grim and dark and super, super weird. Um, but I hope everyone gets a chance to look, check it out because I think it's really interesting. Um, and I hope it doesn't just disappear because I feel like this is one where Disney could just bury for forever. And then three years from now, it's it's not available anywhere or anything like that. So I hope people do check it out. So I remember this movie because of the poster because it looks a lot like that slender man movie poster that came out <laughs> yes <laughs> so i think in my mind i just kind of associated the two as the same thing and then we talked about it for probably like two minutes on the pod and then just it, it left my brain until this moment <laughs> yeah it's it really does they just they had no idea how to market this movie and frankly i don't i don't know how you would either so they just said, like, uh, it's one of those Bye Bye Man, Slender Man, just disposable, terrible horror movies. But it's really good. It's really good and weird. Um, it's kind of one of those where you kind of want you need to study it a little bit. And it's so it's it's amazing that it got made at all, because it is one of those movies where you don't know how any executive was like, oh, yeah, that works. Like, do that with our studio money, because. This movie starts with a 20 minute sequence in the Himalaya mountains that really isn't connected. Well, it's connected to the rest of the movie, but there are no characters that overlap with it. So it's just, it's kind of like this really, it's a great prologue, but that's a, that's like a studio note where they, where some producer would be like, ah, get rid of that. That doesn't matter. Um, so the fact that it's in there and the rest of this movie, it's two hours and 20 minutes. Uh, but the fact that this exists in the way it does is, Oh, like a weird miracle. I kind of hope David Pryor, who's the director, has another chance to direct something because this is this is a very weird and cool movie that I really appreciated. Yeah, I uh, I'm always down for a good horror recommendation, um, which I uh, I I have problems with horror movies that are over an hour and a half, but if exceptions <laughs> are to be made. <laughs> Make the exception for the empty man because it's probably made what two dollars <laughs> and needs your money. <laughs> I can't. I have like sixty Connery films to get through. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that uh, that pretty much wraps up this week's episode of the Movie Bible Podcast. Uh, we'll be back next week talking about more WandaVision. Um, see if the internet is quieted down in the wake of of Marty's comments. Uh, probably talking about more Connery. Um, uh, we're getting into March looks to be a pretty big month. Um, so this will kind of be our last really quiet movie because once you get to March, you have like all of HBO Max's blockbusters, Disney's starting to hit the scene again. Um, so it should be, should be pretty crazy in terms of new releases again here pretty soon. Uh, but remember, you can always check us out online at moviebevel.com. Yeah.